Hi, my name is Pastor Ronald Kozar, and I'd like to welcome you to Crossing Pass today. I'm co-hosting today with Mark Wabazuski. And Mark, I just got back from a trip from Florida with Don Reed. And you would not believe it. He beat me golfing. He shot a 39 on the front nine holes. And I was wondering why. I mean, but Don, he's 85 years old now, and he's had some work done on his eyesight and also his hearing. Yeah, yeah. It's great to be here with, with all of you. Today we have a, truly a wonderful testimony. We have evangelist and author Brian Wills with us. But first, I got to ask, Don, what's going on with you? <laughs> you mean to tell me? I got back from Florida. and These guys won't believe it. Him and Jim Leach, we decided to go down to the Everglades. Everglades, you know, and run them at ride the airboats. Mm -hmm. So I said to Ron, hey, I think I'll drive this thing. He said him and his wife wanted to get off. I said, oh, no. He wouldn't do it. So I just couldn't get even with him, see. So that's why I put these things on today. But it's so fun to every once in a while we need yeah, he's, you get a little bit lost it. You get a little bit goofy after a while, right? I think you've been you goofy. You ought to see him hit a golf ball with those on. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't do that. <laughs> but it, it's, it's nice to be back, you know. Oh, yeah. And I appreciate everybody that's been supporting our ministry here and so forth. So, yeah, our guest today, Ron, uh, Mark, just uh, tell me a little about him because, boy, it's going to be interesting. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. So, so Brian, you grew up uh, in a Christian home. I did. Spirit filled at eight or nine years old. Uh, you know, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your upbringing and then also where your, your true trial really came. Well, first of all, thank you guys for having me. Yeah. And uh, it's such a blessing to be here. Um, I was... Last, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a Christian home, um, and so at an early age, uh, my parents, uh, we, I grew up Baptist, and uh, so I tell people that I got saved and resaved, and you know, as many times in, in ways that you could get saved, you know, I was able to get saved. But uh, you know, I say I say that jokingly, but uh, I'm really thankful for that foundation too because it really kept me on track as far as being a Christian, and so. Um, but it was during a time uh, in the 70s, 1970s, where there was a charismatic revival, charismatic renewal. And uh, even though um, I grew up Baptist and my parents were Baptist, uh, my parents were youth directors and they, they just had a sense that there was a lot more to the Christian life. And so that was during the time where uh, there was a move of the Holy Spirit and people were getting filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and so they started attending different meetings, different conferences, and, and sure enough, they heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They heard about healing. And so um, they got filled with the Holy Spirit and then came back uh, from a conference one weekend and then wanted to share it with 150 young people in our church. And, and so all of a sudden, the young people, uh, you know, they moved from the back row and took over the front row of the Baptist church. and they got filled with the Holy Spirit. So I, I say to people that I, I grew up Baptist, but we became Bapticostal. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so from there, you know, my parents just wanted to know more. And, uh, and so uh, we learned some things about healing and about being filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, just really more about the Bible and, and, the, and more things that, that God has done and has provided for us through his word. And so... But um, I'm here today because I really want to share what God's done in my life. And uh, I was 22 years of age. I, was, I had a dream to play professional tennis. And I was one day away from leaving uh, to, for Europe for several months. And I found myself in a hospital room. And uh, at the time, the doctors thought I had a appendicitis or a kidney stone. I had this pain in my, my abdomen. And um, after several days of testing, uh, a doctor walked in my room and said, young man, I've got bad news to tell you. Uh, you've got uh, terminal incurable cancer. Wow. And so at 22, it never in my life mm. did I expect, uh, you know, at 22, you feel like you're invincible. <laughs> and, uh, but 
the doctor uh, came in and he said, this type of cancer is the fastest growing cancer known to man. Mm. It kills babies within an, an hour or two, children within just a day or two, and the tumors double in size every four to eight hours. And so, uh, so I'll never forget, I call it my moment of impact. Because you were perfectly healthy not yeah. long before this. Yeah, I was like, perfectly healthy. I mean, I was, I was working out like an, like an eight hour day, just, you know, I thought I, you know, it was the best shape of my life, physically fit, all of that. And then to be laid up in a hospital room and the doctor said, uh, you're going to die. You have two weeks to live. Uh, you have terminal cancer. You no oh. pains, no signs, no wasn't any pains or. I, I had I had been complaining of some pains and I'd I'd uh, I'd been to a doctor, I'd been to a urologist, and they just thought, well, maybe uh, maybe you're working out too much, maybe you need to cut back. Um, but other than that, um, you know, there was just you know I just found myself there in the hospital and and. Uh, complaining of a pain and I thought well I need to get this checked out before I leave for Europe wow. and so so that day is was my moment of impact and um, if anyone's ever been diagnosed uh, received a bad diagnosis before uh, you remember the day the time you know uh, you remember uh, you know the room you, you know you remember all of that and so um, so we were there in the hospital and uh, and we told the doctor, we said, well, doctor, uh, we appreciate what you can do, but more importantly, we believe in miracles, and we serve Amen. a God of miracles. Amen. And so the doctor walked out of the room, and I'll never forget my mother. Uh, she opened up the Bible to Isaiah 53, and she said, whose report do we believe? Whose report do we believe? And so um, we... Uh, we dismissed ourselves from the hospital. Went, I went home for about three days, and um, we just spent a lot of time in prayer. Our church home, our church family, you know, came, and everyone prayed for me. But within those three days, um, the cancer spread. The cancer progressed very, very rapidly, very quickly. And so in, uh, in less than 72 hours, I had a tumor that was the size of a golf ball initially, it grew to the size of a basketball. You know what they, I was an athlete also, and, and just to go along with what you're saying, they, they say you really don't need something until you really need it. <laughs> and with you being an athlete, and like you said, we almost think like we're bulletproof until something like this happens. Right. So I just think it's awesome how, how you um, shifted gears in your spiritual realm, and then you're gonna tell us about a little bit about the Bible memorization and how the word really came into your life and, and brought about a healing. I just think it's a phenomenal story. Right, right. Well, you know, so when that cancer grew just within 72 hours, I, I mean, it looked like, looked like I was <laughs> expecting a baby. I mean, uh, and so I was put into a vehicle, transported to another state, to another hospital, the National Institute of Health. And, and so when I arrived on the scene there, uh, the doctors looked at my x-rays, examined me, and uh, they said nothing. They said nothing. They didn't know what to say. So they walked out of the examination room. And my, I was laying there. My parents were sitting there. My parents got up and they walked out. They followed them down the hall. And the doctors turned around and they said to my parents, they said, your son's dying. Your son's dying. Uh, you need to make the funeral arrangements. It's Tuesday morning. Your son will not be alive by Friday. And so um, <coughs> at that time, the cancer had spread into my lungs. My kidneys had stopped functioning. Other organs were beginning to fail. And so uh, I, w you know, uh, I was at that time, I was, I was in a crisis, crisis situation. And so I was admitted to that hospital, put on the 13th floor. Little did I know that the 13th floor is known as the death ward. It's the floor of the incurables. You only go to the 13th floor unless there's nothing that medical science can do. And so, um, so I got to the 13th floor and I began to open up my Bible. And, um, and so I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, if you'll heal me, if you'll get me out of this situation, you know, I call it my foxhole prayer. Mm. Lord, if you'll heal me, if you'll get me out of this situation, then I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. And, 
And so I, I, I remember as, as I just yielded uh, to the Lord, I, I, it's all of a sudden I, I, felt, I felt the presence of the Lord. It was like Jesus, you know, I didn't see him with my physical eyes, but I felt his presence. It was like Jesus walked into my hospital room. And he, he began to tell me, he says, God, he says, Brian, I've got a plan for your life. I've got a destiny for you. And he wow. said, if you'll do the steps that I tell you to take, then, you know, he, your, he, your healing will begin to manifest in your body. I, so, I imagine before this, you were kind of shaken up because right from the beginning, oh, you, yeah. were, you were standing on the word. You expect God to heal you. And then the opposite happens. You just keep getting worse, worse, and worse. So, you, I mean, your faith was probably being tested and you were being shaken up there pretty good prior to this moment. You know, up right? until that point, a lot of other people were praying for me. Yeah. And I thought, well, surely with all the prayers that are going up for me, surely, you know, I'll be fine. I'll make it. I'll, I'll be healed. But then it was like uh, at that moment where I began to call out to God, God was saying, hey, um, I have a destiny. I have a purpose, you know, but, you, if, but if you do the steps, if you follow the steps that I tell you to take, then your healing will manifest. And wow. so it was really at that moment where the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit became real to me. And I always tell people this, I said, if you look to the Holy Spirit, He will lead you out of sickness into healing. Mm -hmm. If you look to the Holy Spirit, He'll lead you, He'll guide you, He'll lead you out of defeat into victory. And so right. it was at that moment I said, well, Holy Spirit, what's the first step? You know, and so, um, so the Holy Spirit began to give us steps as a family and I, I open up my Bible to Proverbs 4, verse 20, where it says, My son, attend to my words, um, and that my words are life and health and medicine to all of your body. And so, so as a family, we begin to go through the Bible. We begin to find scripture verses that promise healing. And, uh, and so um, I begin to write those scriptures down. I begin to put them on sheets of paper. And so we begin to hang those sheets up on the, on the walls in my hospital. And so... Uh, uh, you know, the Bible says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. Amen. And so I begin to read those scriptures out loud. I begin to say Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and, you know, forget not all his benefits. He forgives all my iniquities. He heals all my diseases. I begin to say Psalm 118, verse 17, I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. And so, you know, we begin to go through all these scriptures and begin to say them out loud. And then all of a sudden, the doctors begin to walk in and they said, what is this? What is this? What is, what is this that you're doing? And they begin to ask my parents, have you made the funeral arrangements? You know, your son's not going to live. Your son's going to die. <laughs> and so, uh, so they looked at the scriptures on the wall and they said, what, what is this? They said, well, it's, it's, it's the Bible. It's scriptures. It's the word of God. And they said, that's not going to do you any good. <laughs> and so after... Just ask uh, them, what good are you going to do me? Right, right. <laughs> exactly. Well, I figured, hey, they didn't have anything that they could do. They told me that there was nothing that medical science could do. Yeah. But when I found in the Bible that God's word is medicine, mm. then I said, well, that's my answer there. You know, he sent his word and it healed us. And so I began to take hold of God's word like it was literally medicine to my body. And so as I began to say those scriptures, I was taking my medicine. And, um, and so the doctors, after the first couple of days, they couldn't figure out why I hadn't gotten worse, why I hadn't died yet. And, uh, and so, um, so they were watching our faith. They were, they were coming into the room and they kept asking us, you know, when are you going to accept this disease? When are you going to, um, uh, make the funeral arrangements. And we kept saying, well, we don't plan to because <laughs> we believe in a God of miracles. And so it was at that moment the doctors gave up. They, then they sent in psychologists. So, so your psychologists came in and the, <laughs> the psychologists were trained to kind of get in our face and, and say, what, what makes you think that even if there was a God, he would heal you over somebody else? You know, and, uh, and so the psychologists went over and they, they ripped the scripture verses off the walls and they tore them up mm -hmm. and they threw them in the trash. And they said, so, so where's your God now? Where's your God now? You're laying, you're dying, you, you're full of cancer. You know, where's your God now? And even if there was a God, mm. 
even if there was a God, what makes you think that, that he would heal you? Over Sounds like somebody a psychologist else. might need some therapy. Well, <laughs> I tell people I didn't, I didn't fight cancer as much as I fought the scientific community. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, it makes me I think of the scripture verse in Romans chapter 12. It says, um, do not be conformed yeah. to this world or this world's way of thinking. Yeah. And, um, and so I was on this 13th floor and everyone was programmed to think the, the problem, uh, everyone had accepted the cancer or the disease, mm -hmm. and everyone was planning to die. And so the Lord told me, he said, Brian, if you allow yourself to think the same way as everyone else is thinking, mm -hmm. and if you allow yourself to speak the same way everyone else is speaking, you're going to get the exact same result. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I knew, I knew I had to renew my mind. Yeah. You know, and that's what I was doing. I was taking hold of the Word of God and declaring, by Jesus' stripes, I am healed. Wow. Amen. You know, Brian, many a times we, we know God healed, right? But, you know, the doctors or lawyers or whoever's involved, whether it be psychiatrists or whatever, right? Sometimes they're, they're church members. They're not born again, right. according to John 3, 3 and 1 Peter 1, 23, right? So they're doing the best they could at their particular knowledge. Well, well I, think, I think those people, they, they were, Brian was an offense to them because they have this belief and all of a sudden you're not getting worse. You're standing on the word and, and believing you're gonna be healed. That's conviction to them. They're like, this person really believing in God. This person's really seeing results. If, if, they, if they didn't believe that something was happening, they wouldn't have tore that down. Let this man die in peace. Let him have his comfort as, he, as he's dying. Yeah, not, not offend you. You were an offense to them because they were seeing the power of God through your life, through right. your faith. Right. I think you know? yeah, the yeah. thing that when you were saying in the back that really touched me is when you get to that point, okay, when everything else looks terrible, it was just like Elijah when he told the other prophets of Baal. He said, okay, you go dig a trench and then throw water on it. Well, they was throwing water on your dream, and that's what a lot of the, our viewers need to know, that, yeah. that, a lot of that a lot of times when you're in bad shape, that's when God shows up. Right. So the worse it looks, right. then you know it's getting better if that faith holds on. You know, right. that's, I think it's a great, a great point in your story. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we decided from the very first, you know, whose report do we believe? And despite what things look like, despite how the doctors felt despite what the report said. Um, our family, we stayed together and we just declared, hey, we believe that God's report is, is the truth. Amen. And, so, um, and so it was, it was a battle. You know, it was a battle being in that type of environment. And, um, but, um, you know, in, uh, to make a long story short, in the end, uh, I woke up one morning um, and up until that point, the doctors kept, kept saying I was not going to live. I was going to die with cancer. And, and I was given two weeks to live, three days to live, and then at one point given 10 hours to live. But I woke up one morning and um, the doctor came in and asked me how I was feeling. I said, I feel great. And, uh, and so I had a CAT scan that day and the doctor came in my room with this shocked look on his face. And he said, Brian, I'm carrying the x-ray from the radiologist. He said, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to say. We have no medical explanation for this. But the radiologist examined you from head to toe three times. And he told me, there's no evidence of cancer Amen. in your body. You Thanks, know, Mark, too, but don't you think, too, in, in defense of the doctors, okay? They've seen a lot of prayers in the hospital not yeah. answered, you follow me? And, they might be carrying sure. that in, and if they're not into the Word of God. No, absolutely. They're trained to know what medical science says. They're but doing the best they sure. can. Sure. Yeah, they say there's no way, but God has a way of making a way where there is no right. way. That's why, like you said, it's so important to renew your mind to the Word of God. Because the, the, in reality, there's all kinds of situations that can look like there's no way. But if you, remind to, you renew your mind to the Word of God, God can always make a way right. without exception. Right. And if you look at the difference between the life that Jesus lived and your average Christian, what's the, what's the greatest difference? Because Jesus gave us authority. He said we can do the same things that he did. Yes. And if you're not seeing the same things, it's because you have not renewed your mind to the level that Jesus did. Mm -hmm. And if you did, you would see the, the same exact results and greater. Right. 
I mean, that, that really, I mean, as simple as that scripture is, that is the, the reason why people are or are not seeing the promises of God in their life. Right. It says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that mm -hmm. we can prove what's the perfect and acceptable will of God on this right. earth. So what you was holding on to was God's perfect will right. and they were giving up. That's why if you're watching today, never give up on God. Because mm -hmm. I don't care how bad your situation mm -hmm. looks, the worse it looks, God is getting ready to show up. Only Jesus is the healer. Amen. You know, and so uh, I was just speaking to, um, at a university with medical students, and I was talking to them about the difference between faith and medicine. And I said, now you guys are being trained in the natural. You know, and God has put natural laws in this universe. But where faith comes in is that faith taps into spiritual laws. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and so the spoken word is a spiritual law, you know, and so whenever you apply a spiritual law, then it's going to affect the natural law. It's a higher level of truth. Yes. You know, you have the natural truth then the spiritual truth, which trumps natural truth. Yeah. Because the spiritual realm created the physical realm. Right. It is greater. And the doctors kept yeah. saying, you're not coping with reality. But, you know, Jesus said, you shall know the truth mm -hmm. and the truth shall set you free. Mm -hmm. One of the definitions I found about truth is that, is that it's the highest form of reality. Yeah. Amen. Truth is the Holy Spirit. And yes. Uh, you know, when you, uh, just real quickly, you know, you were Baptist background, and you were Catholic background, you got baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Word become alive a little bit more. Maybe, maybe the particular denomination didn't go further into the, you know, the, a lot of, we make it very clear too, you're born again, you're saved, you don't have to speak in tongues to be saved or bat filled with the Holy Spirit as we would call it. You know, it's very important. People out there think, well, I'm not saved. No, you were saved. Mm -hmm. when you were saved, right? And he was saved, right? But then God gave you additional power, additional gift. And then the word becomes alive. Isn't that what you said? We were talking about Romans 12, 8, uh, 12, 1. It said, be not conformed, right? But be ye transformed, right? By the renewing of what? Let me go in my mind. That you may prove what is good, acceptable, perfect will of God. And that's what you were doing. You know, so many times we forget that, right? This is the word. Yeah. Right? Yeah, this is what renews your mind. Yes, yes. Yep. And, and, and once it becomes alive, you know, I'm sure that a lot of people out there might not agree on the gift of the Spirit, all right? But the main thing that we know is that you have to be born again in John 3.3 3 and 1 Peter 1.23. That's the most important thing of any yes. ministry, right? Amen. Yes. But so. the gifts are the gifts. But you have to seek them, and you, you came to a point where you said you asked for it, right? Right. Because a lot of people won't do that. And I think that's where we're missing today. What do you think? Oh, yeah. I mean, the Bible says, you know, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, you know, blessed are they. Uh, you know, it's draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. It's what you put in is what you get out. You know, if you're not willing to draw near to God and spend time uh, in relationship with him and learning your word, then you're not going to receive all that God has for you because you won't even have the faith to, to stand by it. You know, if someone, if you didn't know the scriptures when those people were telling you you're crazy, you wouldn't have had the faith to reject those. You know, the Bible says, take every thought captive. You were taking those thoughts that they were putting in your head and you say, no, I don't receive that. I cast those down to the pit of hell. I'm going to be saved. You know, I'm going to be healed. And you were. And, and real quickly now, are you going to foreign countries? Tell me a little about it. We only got about a minute here, okay? Yeah, so I'm a traveling missionary. I, uh, God's given me a mandate to reach one nation every other month. And so, uh, in the last year, kind of our new assignment is to go into the Muslim world and uh, preach the gospel. Have you and been to some of the Muslim I've countries? been to Turkey and Syria and, and uh, you know, getting ready to go uh, back into Lebanon and some other places. But uh, right now, it's, it's just a tremendous season, tremendous time of harvest. Uh, the Muslims yeah, you was are telling so us open. about the willingness of the Muslims and everybody. I think that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, just being able to come up to Muslims on the street and say, hey, I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus. Can I pray for you? And, and they drop everything and say, yes, I want, so I want to know about they Jesus. Are. They're open-minded. Yes. And, uh, of course, many Muslims are having visitations of Jesus. And God's using different types of technology now to reach, you know, into the Muslim real world. Real quickly, you, right. book, what about the book? No, you have a book there, right? I do. Can you just hold that up real quick? I don't know that we can bring that in later on, right? Yeah, What's we can scan it in. Go ahead. What's the name of it? Uh, the name of my book, the testimony, is 10 Hours to Live. Okay. Now, our time's running out, but I just want to say out there, if you want that book, we can call our ministry and we can forward it to them, right? Mm -hmm. And so forth. But the main thing is, any, you know, God heals. He, and, you know, it's a mind, will, body, soul. He heals. But sometimes it's in his time. 
And, and we believe, we believe in healing here without there. But there's somebody out there today, I believe, that don't know Jesus. Now, the first thing you know, you've got to know Jesus. You were very fortunate to bring up in yes. a Christian family, very fortunate at the age of nine or so forth. I mean, that's, I, that's a, I, I admire somebody like that. But tell me something out there today. You're watching this program and you say, well, Don, I don't know Jesus or Mark or Ron. Yes, let me tell you something. There's one way I know. All you do is simply confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of your life. Amen. There's no long prayer. Just give your heart. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He happened, pro football player, he had to do it. He did it. Ron did it. All of, Mark did it. All of us sometime in our life. So if you have there today, just ask the Lord to come into your life right now and ask him to forgive you for your sins. And I want to tell you something. We have a telephone number, 724-981-7777. Also 1-855-981-9777. Someone will be there to answer that telephone. But just remember, today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. God loves you. And thank you for watching Crossing Past Television. News. When you support Crossing Paths, you're helping to release the power of testimony. There's many people who know about God, but they don't know Him personally. They don't know His true nature, and they don't know His heart. The stories that we bring you each week testify to the power of God and to the love of God. Through these testimonies, people all over the country are getting to know the Lord and developing a hunger to know Him more. When that relationship becomes alive, it's clear to see that no person or no situation is too far gone for the power of God. I like to share with people that it's very important to know who you are in Christ because that day, if that was me laying there, I know that I would have missed uh, heaven. Revelation 12, 11 says, and they overcame him, referring to the devil, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. God is still the same. He's still this, God's word is still the same. They say times are changing. Times are changing, but God is still the same. <laughs> it's, it's a no brainer for me. You don't have to have a doctor degree to know oh. that God is good. He loves sinners. He just does not like to sin. When you partner with Crossing Pass and sow a seed into this ministry, you are helping us get the power of the testimony and the gospel over the airwaves. This will help people understand better who God is and connect them to the plans He has for them. Please call us today and support this vision.